Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for braving the elements. Uh, it's really quite impressive to see so many people here on a night when it is so unpleasant out. Uh, I'd like to thank into the mic. People are complaining already. <laughs> no one. I've been on for ten seconds, and people are already using their free speech rights. You know, let's do moderation in all things, except maybe free speech. We'll try again. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your criticisms. <laughs> thank you for sharing. Uh, I'd also like to thank our media sponsors, uh, WHMP, uh, NorthamptonMedia.com, and uh, uh, Northampton Cable Television. Uh, we thank all of you and all everyone who is uh, broadcasting this and taping this. All of you should be forewarned. I don't think it's a great secret. If you speak, you are going to be taped. You will be broadcast. You will probably add to your FBI file. <laughs> Although we can't guarantee the last one, we can guarantee the former. So uh, tonight we're going to have, I think, a really interesting program. We're going to talk about really the three legs of the stool that make up the ACLU's program. We're going to talk about legislation, and we're going to talk about uh, obviously focusing, as you know, on surveillance and privacy and government snooping and spying. The three parts, the three legs of the stool of the ACLU's program uh, involve litigation, which you know about. And we sue a lot of people, and mostly the government, over doing bad things to people. And Laura Rotolo from our Boston office is going to talk about some of those litigation efforts in Massachusetts. Or to my right. To my left is Chris Calabrese uh, from our Washington office, from the ACLU National Office in Washington. Chris is a privacy lobbyist. Everyone in the world has a spokesperson in Congress. We have Chris. Okay, so it's Chris. All right, it's mostly Chris um, versus 500 other people. That, okay, that part's true. Uh, who do not have our interests in privacy and uh, uh, our own ability to live our lives without government surveillance at heart. And Chris is the second part of this, or represents really the second part of this ACLU effort, which is to prevent horrible laws or proposed laws from becoming law and to allow some uh, positive and affirmative laws from coming into being. The third part of our program, both nationally and in the state, is education and uh, uh, advocacy at the local level. And the person who is our field director in Massachusetts is Whitney Taylor on the my far right, at least physically as these chairs are set up today. Um, and uh, that really involves... <laughs> That involves, the field program really involves and encompasses a lot of our educational efforts and advocacy efforts at the local level. And that's crucial. A lot of these fights are fought locally. Uh, and uh, it is our educational efforts and our local advocacy efforts and our field program that make that possible. And Whitney is going to talk tonight about some of those efforts, including our specific legislative efforts in Massachusetts because we have bills coming before the legislature this session that are crucial. So let's start. Chris Calabrese. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me and I, I reiterate thank you so much for coming out on what is undoubtedly a very crummy night. Um, I'm gonna, sorry I won't read too much but I want to kind of share this. No, on November 10th, 2004, the, the California State Fresno Student Group, Campus Peace and Civil Liberties Coalition, hosted a lecture by a prominent vegan scholar to talk about veganism. There were about 60 people in the room. Among them, there were six law enforcement officers, three from the state, three from the, from the local government. So 10%. Um, you know, according to great work that Laura and others have done here, the Commonwealth Fusion Center's standard operating procedure, which is a, deals with law enforcement intelligence collection 
allows law enforcement to attend public meetings to gather intelligence in plain clothes, attend public meetings in plain clothes to gather intelligence. So I, I'm just wondering if there are any law enforcement officers in the room. You can not identify yourself or not. I mean, we're not going to say anything here that we won't put on our website and you won't see on TV. But that's become standard, a standard operating procedure to come to groups like this and, and much more perniciously to, to infiltrate closed meetings, to attempt to guide the actions of groups, to grab, you know, guide what parade route they might take or the particular actions they might undertake, undercover law enforcement officers. The ACLU has done a fairly exhaustive but by no means complete survey and found that in at least 33 states and the District of Columbia, we have undercut, we have intelligence gathering by undercover police officers and other attempts to suppress speech and to, to investigate activists. So I'm going to talk today about three sort of pieces of this that are interrelated. One is the spying on activists. One is the sort of rationale behind pushing law enforcement to do this. And the third is the mechanism, the sort of the organizing groups, and they're called fusion centers, that, sh that spread this information. So we've talked a little about the activists. So how did we get here? Well, right after 9-11, there was this idea that law enforcement, and it continues to this day, was not just about finding criminals. It was about gathering intelligence. And there was this idea of intelligence-led policing. And so the problem with intelligence is that people haven't actually done anything wrong yet. Because if they had, it wouldn't be intelligence. It would simply be regular law enforcement, right? I mean, that would just be you committed a crime. We expect law enforcement to find you if we find you planning to, you know, detonate a bomb. That's what we want you to do. Well, but intelligence-led policing instead had to be broader than that. So it focused on all kinds of what we would consider to be benign activities, like taking photographs, drawing diagrams, espousing extreme views. I mean, I don't know about you, but my father-in-law espouses extreme views every night. <laughs> no, he's a great guy. No. But the, this, this is not just sort of in the air. This was the DHS. DH, or excuse me, not DHS, the Director of National Intelligence Information Gathering uh, Database. The protocols for sharing information with that included these kind of things. Oh, and my favorite was learning new things. Get, get, gaining new skills was something that you should be on the lookout for. And this was rapidly endorsed by, say, the L, by like the Los Angeles Police Department, which you know immediately told all its officers, you should go out and you have to report all these things when you see them, these various activities, this photo taking. And so what happens when you do this, of course, is that, first of all, you can't collect all of this. There's no way you could grab every guy who's taking a picture or everyone who's espousing a view. So what ends up happening, of course, is you pull in people that you don't like or you're concerned about, that you know, seem off to you for some reason. And, you know, and we get, gather information about them, we surveil them, we infiltrate their organizations, we arrest them in some cases. And you know, it all comes out of this sort of mistaken belief that police officers can be intelligence agents. And so how does this inform, and this is a very broad overview, and I'll take this moment to plug the website. It's www.aclum.org. And if you go there, you'll find a lot more detail on all of this, including, you know, a long, I, I printed it out before I came. Our list of incidents that we just called from the, the newspaper is, I think it's like 35 pages long. Just descriptions of, of groups that have been infiltrated and, and you know, people who've been arrested. So it, it's, it's not, these are not isolated. This is, this is something that's happening. So what, what happens with that information after you collect it on groups and individuals? Well, it's shared both through entities that are called fusion centers. 
And there are now about 78 fusion centers across the country, both state and local fusion centers. And these are groups of large, these are groups of law enforcement officers, um, sometimes, you know, at the state level, at the federal level, at the local level. They're also military. There's, in some cases, private corporations. And they've been formed with the purpose of collecting intelligence. So collecting it from the local level, and it's, in some cases, housing it in these fusion centers, but also sharing it up to the federal level in giant, you know, intelligence databases. And then also sharing down intelligence information from the federal level to the local level. So you can quickly move this, this information back and forth. And we've seen, what we've seen from these fusion centers is a really disturbing lack of, a, a number of patterns. One is a disturbing lack of accountability. Because you have people from all these different groups, right? You got federal law enforcement, state law. So you don't necessarily, they don't necessarily all answer to one person. You can't then push one, you know, one agenda. You can't say go to one guy and say this has to be fixed. Stop them. Well, we're, that, that's the state guys. That's not us. Or that's the federal guys. Or that's the local guys. So you, you don't have accountability for this. And the funding comes from a variety of sources. It comes from federal funding. It comes from state funding. So you can't say, well, I'm going to cut your funding off. Or, you know, and so all of this leads to sort of a lack of accountability and the building of profiles and the writing of reports. And I'll, and I'll give you an example of how this can go. I'll give you a couple examples how this can go really bad. The state of Maryland Fusion Center was caught uh, I don't know, two years ago now, a year and a half ago now, um, spying on dozens of local groups, including about 50 anti-death penalty and, and peace activists, and <clears throat> placing them in the Fusion Center database as terrorists. You know, at ter not, you know, conditional, not terrorists and disseminating that information to local police like the Baltimore police, disseminating it to DHS, or excuse me, the Department of Homeland Security, and really widely sharing information. Um, in, in another case, we had a fusion center in Missouri who was writing about sort of the, the other side of the coin, about the dangerous right-wing activists who were frequently followers of, of Bob, who were frequently supporters of presidential candidate Ron Paul or Bob Barr, and who, you know, were right-wing extremists. And, you know, I'll give you another example. A Virginia Fusion Center issued a report calling the black colleges in Virginia to be nodes of radicalism that needed to be monitored. Now, this would be, a lot of this stuff would be laughable. And in fact, there has been some pushback by state police who say things like, well, this isn't really useful information. We're not, this, this isn't helping us catch any criminals. We just, but it's coming from federal, you know, it's coming, coming blessed from these fusion centers as this intelligence information that has to be gathered. So we've got the fusion centers, we've got the suspicious activity reporting, and we've got, you know, now we, and so we've got a lot of spying on activists. And I'm wondering, should I talk a little bit about, I'm trying to decide, I should talk a little bit about, let me just give you one or two harms. And down in Connecticut recently, uh, somebody was, a, an activist was arrested for taking photos of the governor. And it turned out that they, the state police had been following his blog where he said critical things about the governor. Not violent things, not dangerous things, simply political criticisms. And he was photographing her. He was arrested for that. Now, you know, when we look at that, we think, well, or some people have asked me, I think maybe this audience might get it, but I'll, you know, what's the big deal? It's a few fringe types, it's a few law enforcement officers, you know, it's, it's kind of a rogue age, you know, operation. Well, it's not a rogue operation, of course. It's been institutionalized and standardized, but more to the point, these are the mechanisms that we change our society and our government, right? We get together, we organize, we espouse radical views because we think they're right. We make sure that we get together and we let our political representatives know that we're upset. Well, what happens if you're afraid to do that? 
what happens if you think that that's going to expose you to criticism? It's going to expose you to tracking. It's going to put you in a terrorism database. Well, you're going to be less likely to do it. You're going to be more likely to toe the line. It breaks the political process in the United States. And so I, I think that's why the ACLU has taken this so seriously. That's why we have pushed to do a better, get DHS to do a better job of tracking these fusion centers, improve the standards for how information is collected, force them to actually have standards, um, you know, and push back on some of these other federal fusion centers to not accept what in, in essence is just rumor and gossip and innuendo, but to have a, a reasonable suspicion standard that this is related to, to something. So it's a, it's a difficult process because of the lack of accountability that I talked about, because of the variety of funding sources. But it, it's, it's a battle we're, we're undertaking, and we're undertaking in, in every state, I think, or, or almost every state. And so with that, and I'm happy to answer questions about this, I'm so glad to see so many of you out here caring about this, worried about this. And I'll let Laura talk a little bit about what's going on in Massachusetts, and then I'm sure we'll have a great discussion. Uh, let me just say, I, did, uh, uh, I didn't mean to not introduce myself as Bill Newman, and I run the Western Massachusetts office. Uh, <laughs> which I thought we should do. And, I, and, and as Chris said, we will have questions afterwards after the two additional uh, presentations. Great. Thank you. So again, my name is Laura Rotolo, and I work um, here at our ACLU of Massachusetts. Can you hear me? Sorry. Can you hear me? Is this okay? Okay. I will try to speak louder. I was loud. Okay. <laughs> I'm All used right. to yelling at Congress. Try to get along, everyone. Oh, that's <laughs> right. We're on the same okay. team. Okay. <laughs> Great. So I want to tell you about what's going on at our state level. Um, the things that Chris has told you about are very true here, uh, more so maybe than in other states. For better or for worse, Massachusetts has really been at the forefront of a lot of this. Part of that has to do with the fact that two of the airplanes on 9-11 took off from Logan Airport. So Boston and by, you know, extension, all of Massachusetts has really been a focus um, of the federal government's funding of many, many of the things that you're going to hear about today. So there's just this constant stream of money and political will that is coming down from the federal government. So Massachusetts has be actually been a pilot state for many of the uh, programs that are happening around the country. Again, for better or for worse. So for example, you know, Logan Airport was one of the first two airports to get the full body scanners. Um, you know, Boston, the city of Boston was the first city to take part in this secure communities program where everybody who's arrested gets uh, sent, have their fingerprints sent to ICE. And that's a pilot program that's coming to the entire state and the entire country. So um, we really, unfortunately, have sort of led the way. Um, and part of that is the fusion center that uh, Chris told you about. So just to tell you about how we find out about these things. Um, the way that, you know, obviously you can read the papers and wait for people to leak things, but what we have been doing proactively out of our office and out of many offices around the country is to file requests under the Freedom of Information Act with the federal government and our state public records laws. And so we have, you know, over, you know, almost two dozen uh, requests outstanding and documents coming in every once in a while. Um, the documents are very hard to decipher. Sometimes they're extremely technical. Um, and it, they mostly lead to more questions. So we learn one thing and then we do another request following up on that um, to try to learn a little bit more, uh, to try to piece together these pieces of this puzzle. So, you know, we've learned a couple of things. We've got multi-millions of dollars coming in to, to Boston and Boston actually spreads it out to the entire state for things such as training for IEDs, uh, you know, in, in Improvised, improvised explosive, explosive devices. devices. So the things that go off in Afghanistan and um, you know, Iraq, we have millions of dollars coming into the state to train for that. We have millions of dollars to train you know, for a terrorist attack, um, money coming in for improved communications, but a lot of the money that's coming is coming for increased surveillance. And that's where our concern is really uh, you know, top. So this anti-terrorism strategy that um, Chris is telling you about, um, it has, I think it has three very dangerous components. First, the component that all agencies should share information. So we've got local agencies sharing with the state, sharing with the federal government. 
The second component is an increasing of passive surveillance. So we're not just talking about you know, choosing one person who is uh, somehow suspicious and surveilling them. It's uh, surveillance cameras everywhere. It's police officers who have mounted on their cruisers machines that read license plates. So they can just go around uh, your town and read everybody's license plate and write down, you know, it goes into a database where it says this license plate was at this place at this time. Everybody, you know, because they would argue that there's no expectation of privacy on the street. But there's this record being kept of where your car is at all times. Obviously the fast pass system, you know, that goes into a database and never ever comes out. <laughs> um, it's easy and cheap to do this passive intelligence gathering. You know, it's just very easy to just keep all this data. It's actually cheaper to keep data than it is to erase data um, nowadays. And this requires no individualized suspicion. And the third component is increased automation. So as we make the databases bigger, we rely on machines, on technology to sort out what is most important. We like to call this um, looking, for the haste, looking for the needle by making the haystack bigger. And the way you find the needle is you have a machine to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know this is fundamentally flawed. Even President Obama said of the Christmas Day bombing that you know, the, the attempt was not a failure of intelligence gathering. We had all the pieces. We didn't put them together because there are too many pieces to put together at this point. So the more uh, you know, random information you have, the harder it is to actually focus on real suspects. Um, and the, obviously the other problem with this is that you know, when you are just taking information of everybody, you are really, you know, there's a chilling effect on everyone's ability to express themselves, to um, you know, act politically, to uh, you know, speak out against the government. So for example, um, rallies, demonstrations are routinely videotaped now. Um, many of you have probably gone to, you know, have been at events here in Northampton. Um, you know, we see this all the time where you've got somebody from the state police, from your local police, uh, maybe the federal government with little camcorders and they're just going around. And our question is why? You know, what's happening with this data? Why are you videotaping protesters? Um, and it would actually really be helpful to us if you are, you know, at a rally like this and you see this going on, to take a picture of it and let us know about it. We're, you know, we're thinking about uh, public records requests again to see what's happening with, you know, this video. Yeah. And, wh and then what they told us, you know, when, when we asked them, they say, you know, it's, it's prevention, you know, if something goes wrong, we want to, you know, we want to deter people from doing bad things. You know, those anarchists are always getting, you know, into trouble. Um, and if something goes wrong, we've got it on video. But, you know, we, we really want to know. So if, if this happens to you, um, we'd love to hear about it. Had an activist arrested for yeah. writing down the license. I'm sorry, I just couldn't yeah. help but share this. We had someone, and I, I, the state is escaping now. She, after a day-long rally where they were taking pictures of all the protesters and going around the video camera, she had the audacity to write down the license plate of the car of the person who was doing this, and she was promptly arrested for that. Now, I, I, I mean, you know, these arrests rarely go anywhere because I mean, what is she being arrested for? Nothing, in essence. But it's harassment, and it's, you know, I mean. But it's become systematized, and it, there's this emboldenedness about it that, that's really, the brazenness is, is just amazing. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, no, I, no. I get fired up. <laughs> so Why you're paid the big bucks. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of you, thank you. <laughs> so I think I wanted to tell you a little bit about two things. One is our state fusion center, our Commonwealth Fusion Center, and two is a little bit more about these suspicious activity reports, which we've found out a little bit about. So um, this thing called the Fusion Center, um, again, Massachusetts was the first one. It actually, uh, our governor, Mitt Romney, was the architect of this whole system. Uh, now, like Chris said, there's 78 of them around the country, but Massachusetts was the pilot one. And what it is, it's this, um, you know, it's this building where, it, when we talked to the police about it, they, they once told me, why are you so upset? It's just cops with computers. That's all it is. <laughs> so <laughs> it's cops sitting around with a lot of, you know, monitors and computers. But who's sitting around the table? I'll tell you, you know, through our Freedom of Information Act request, we found out that the, um, the Massachusetts Fusion Center has the Massachusetts National Guard, the FBI, the Mass Chiefs of Police, um, a section of the Army that I'd never heard of, um, 
the Mass Department of Corrections, the Department of Public Health, um, the Mass Fire Departments, um, and they even have multi-jurisdictional um, representatives there from Maine, New Hampshire, and New Jersey State Polices. So these people are all sitting around sharing information. Um, and it's unclear to us, you know, where the lines of authority are. So we know that the National Guard people don't answer to the state police. They, you know, answer to the military. You know, who does New Jersey answer to? You know, where are the lines? Where, where is the authority there? And it gets very confusing. Um, and the thing is that, you know, this is all funded as anti-terrorism work. But the mission of the Fusion Center is what they call all hazards, all threats, all crimes. So even though the money and the political will is there to do this as you know, a way to fight terrorism, they're really looking at absolutely everything. So we have a real problem of mission creep there. Um, and what we've discovered is in their, their standard operating procedures, they themselves say that the Commonwealth Fusion Center can have undercover operatives, they can go to meetings, um, and there was this one line that scared us a lot that said, it, even if it's a meeting where there's a lawyer present and they're talking about attorney-client privileged information, the undercover operative doesn't have to leave. So, and they have sworn to us that, that this is not happening, that yes, it's part of their procedures, but they don't actually have people out there. But we have found people who have been interviewed by you know, agents from the Fusion Center. And again, if this happens to you, we would love to hear about it. Uh, we really need to be hearing individual stories uh, about people contacted by the Fusion Center. Um, and the second thing I just wanted to talk a little bit more about is this idea of suspicious activity reports. Suspicious activity reports are the way by which your normal, everyday cop on the street sends information to the federal government through the Fusion Center. And what is a suspicious activity? And that's where it gets kind of funny. <laughs> I will read to you what a suspicious activity report is uh, under the federal government's definition. It's official documentation of observed behavior that may be indicative of intelligence gathering or pre-operational planning related to terrorism, criminal, or other illicit intention. So just to break that down, it may be indicative of intelligence gathered or pre-operational planning related to terrorism, criminal, um, or other illicit intention. So it might be an illicit intention, or it might be planning for an illicit, I don't know how you plan for an intention, but. <laughs> You, you get to see what Chris is saying. You haven't committed a crime, basically. Um, somebody's thought you were suspicious, and all of a sudden, instead of just an officer you know, looking at you um, or maybe following you around for 10 minutes, they file a report. It goes into this fusion center. It goes into this massive database. It goes to the federal government. And there's this you know, paper trail that makes it seem a lot more suspicious than it actually is. Um, so we've seen you know, people who are photographing buildings or hanging around infrastructure who you know, have SARs filed on them. And again, it goes into this giant database where there's no oversight, and Whitney will tell you a little bit about um, our ideas about how to fix that. Um, so we're trying to learn more. Our FOIA work and our public records work is still ongoing. The more we find out, the more questions we have, the more requests we make. Someday we'll have a puzzle, you know, all the puzzle pieces together. Uh, for example, we learned recently that there is such a thing called the Western Massachusetts uh, Regional, uh, Western Massachusetts Homeland Security Region. Um, so this area is actually getting a ton of money from Department of Homeland Security. Um, we recently filed a request with that uh, agency to find out what they're getting, what it's going to, what it's being used for. We also find out that there's something called the Regional Surveillance Camera System that um, they, you know, the, they applied for grant funding from the Department of Homeland Security and we think they got it, we don't know what it is, you know, or is it just going to be cameras all around the state wired in together? We're trying to find out more. Um, Everything we have found is up on the web. The website is, um, it's actually the national website, aclu.org slash spy-files-massachusetts. Every single document we've gotten is up there because we believe you know, in openness and transparency. Um, so I invite you to go there and to please tell us your stories if you know, anything like this does happen to you here. I just like to point out, you two guys are really depressing. <laughs> you know, I, I actually did have a, like, a cheerful bit at the end, and I, I, I didn't get to it. Um, there, we have had things that are, are successful. We've had fusion centers trying to do the right thing. We've had fusion centers beginning to to try to be professional. To, you know, we actually had the fu two, two fusion centers. 
it was Georgia and Florida, actually agreed to sort of do an exchange program and audit each other's files to make sure that they were behaving in an appropriate manner. I mean, they're not, it's not like, they're people who are trying to do the right thing, but, you know, the problem is they're being sent these standards that are meaningless. And if you're told to do a, a, a something that's inherently nonsensical, you are going to do a bad job of it. That's just that's just the facts. And, and so, but we, they you know they are starting to see that we did have one federal agency who who agreed that it's the, it's suspicious activity reporting was in fact problematic under the Constitution, was implicating First Amendment activity, and so they agreed that they would stop collecting that information, right? That which is great, that's a win, because if you stop collecting the, the First Amendment protected activity like protests, et cetera, we're a long way. So the problem is there are at least three other federal entities collecting the same information. So if I can't find it in that database, because they were good enough to keep it out, I've got three other databases I can look at. But we are getting, you know, it, it's slow, but there is, a, you know, some success. Sorry. Again, I was going to use that line to introduce Whitney as to say how we might do something in Massachusetts to make this better. Sorry. But you got that. <laughs> you started out kind of optimistic. You ended up depressing again, yeah, right? Yeah. They just really, really don't want to give me the mic is, is what's going on. Um, hi, everybody. Again, I'm Whitney Taylor. I'm the field director for the ACLU of Massachusetts. And, um, you know, there are things that we are doing at the ACLU of Massachusetts to, to at least in our capacity here in this state, deal with these issues. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware, but just to go through it, the Massachusetts uh, legislative session is two years long. And so there's a whole bunch of time to do a whole bunch of nothing. <laughs> but uh, we are starting a new session. Uh, this coming year and we have two pieces of legislation that we're introducing uh, that we're very excited about and um, and that we really hope is going to start us down the path of trying to not only gather all the pieces of this puzzle but then help not only the general public but our elected officials wrap their minds around what's actually going on and see if this is actually the, the, the Commonwealth we want the, the America we want um, it's funny uh, when you listen to Chris and, and, and Laura talk about this stuff, they keep uh, talking about intelligence gathering. Uh, well, we decided that our bill that, that most of this, the information they're gathering is not intelligent whatsoever. <laughs> it is not leading to anything. So we have, ha are really striving right now to stop using the word intelligence um, um, in this because it, it truly isn't. I mean, the word intelligence makes you feel, okay, they're doing something uh, out there to protect us. Uh, from an international threat or people here at home and that's not what they're gathering so the the first uh, piece of legislation that I want to talk about this is going to be its its second year its sophomore year in the in the legislature and we are now calling the data data profiling prevention act so you know we're like people get that 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 profiling is probably not a good thing that we want to prevent this profiling from happening and that we're good, and this profiling is happening of data. Now, just so everybody knows, this name can change because um, these bills aren't going to be introduced until January. Um, but if you keep, you, if you sign up and, and you keep up with us, you know, as soon as we have the real titles of things and the real bill numbers, you know, you'll you'll follow right along with us. Um, but what we're trying to do here in Massachusetts is a lot of what Chris was talking about that a couple of places have done voluntarily. We want to put it into our law that this is what needs to be done with our data collection and our fusion centers in Massachusetts. The first thing is that First Amendment rights and um, uh, are protected. That law enforcement is prohibited to collect information about individuals' political, religious views, associations, and activities unless they can prove specifically that it's to a criminal investigation. So basically what we're saying is, is that you need reasonable suspicion to start collecting data on this person. And just if they're a loud mouth like me out there talking about stuff, that doesn't give you the right to start collecting data about them. Um, the second part of this bill is actually about data integrity and standards. Oh my gosh, imagine mm -hmm. this. Having standards for what kind of data you want to um, collect, to have security procedures 
to actually have a system um, ensuring that the information is reviewed and reliable before it goes out into this huge system of the world. I mean, if you put bunk in, you're gonna get bunk out. And I was being very nice with that word bunk, I yeah, thought. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, and uh, secondly on this, that once this information starts being disseminated, that um, it's being disseminated to people who have a need to know and a right to know. That it's not just that it's being sent out everywhere, that there's actually purposes behind the need for looking at this information about people. Um, and then basically, you know, it's codifying, you know, basic standards um, in, in the law and making sure that we're kind of trying to, to approach this in somewhat of a logical way. Um, the third part of this bill is about transparency and oversight. Um, uh, one of the things that, that we built into this is, is trying to see how can we, we need an independent body kind of looking at this and seeing whether or not these other parts of, of the bill are being watched, whether or not the, the data is good, whether or not it's being collected in a reasonable way, whether or not it's data that should be in there. So we're actually um, have started having conversations and working with, with the Inspector General's office. You know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. We have an Inspector General's office, so why don't we make put it in into, into their uh, realm of making sure that that the data that's being collected is, the, is, is good, reliable data, and that it's not just a frivolous information that they're collecting about people. Who is the, the Inspector General? Oh, it's just the office. Just the office, it would be the office of the Inspector General? Yeah. What is that, what is that? Is it the? Uh, it, well, it, <laughs> I wish God you were here. Our, our legislative council could answer that better. It's just an oversight yeah. office for the, the mic. Sorry. It's an over, yeah. the question is about what is the Inspector General's office? Um, and that's just an office uh, that's part of the governor's, the executive branch, and it oversees various different agencies. Um, so this is sort of what they do, is they oversee different agencies. I don't remember his name, it's, but. I don't remember his name, but yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's one of those things kind of having this independent body that can look at it, all the other bodies and not have with, you know, internal oversight. It's actually supposed to be separate. Um, and the other thing uh, that, that is part of this is that individuals can go and see if you have a file. Um, you know, it's always kind of fun. We sit around the ACL and go, ooh, how big is your FBI file? And, um, but there would be an actual mechanism um, in this bill uh, to, to allow folks to, to look and see about their own file. So that is kind of, um, you know, the, the, the uh, name of this event is, is Secrecy and Surveillance. So that's kind of how we are, are moving forward on trying to deal with this surveillance culture that is happening and how we can take the first step in, uh, you know, this is a big train that's moving. Uh, very quickly, but we can start to turn it, at least make sure there's some standards, there's some reliability, and that there's some oversight. Um, on the, the secrecy part, uh, you know, the thing that's so great is the government expands watching what we do, they keep closing the window for us to watch them. Um, and so we are actually going to be introducing um, a, a, a three separate bills. And, and that's mostly for just logistical reasons, uh, because it's, it's kind of a big area of the law. But you know, going back after our Massachusetts public records law. Now, I believe this, the last time the Massachusetts public records law was updated was 1973. So imagine that you know now we have computers and email and all of these other wonderful things. And um, you know, our law hasn't been updated since 73. Um, so um, what we want to do is in these three separate bills. Uh, do uh, a couple things. We want to make sure that the burden on the local government, actually, so we're, you know, this isn't just about the government is bad and, you know, we're good. Uh, we want to work, there's a huge burden on local governments when people go in to ask for information. There's huge filing systems and cabinets and, and craziness and everything they have to do. So we want to try and lessen that burden um, by making sure that records are kept electronically. I mean, kind of as simple as that. Let's, you know, let's put some money into the front end of the system and let's get everything to be electronic. Um, and it would also help diffuse the very high costs uh, that people have to uh, pay to get this information. Um, and you know, very often there's no standardization, just so you know, on, the, on, on where you go to ask for money. And um, I personally, the, without working with the ACLU, just have a little story. I was working on a, a campaign out in Berkshire County uh, for a district attorney. And we wanted some information from the current district attorney. Uh, well, I was told it was going to cost four dollars a page, and it was at least you know umpteen mounds of pages. I'm going. I don't have six thousand dollars just to find out you know who you're arresting. Um, but so, you know, there's actually this way of of hopefully standardizing and making it so we can get information. It's not a burden on this on the local governments. It's not a burden of cost to us. 
Um, you know, and, and looking back at these these things, I mean, imagine if we had a better transparency law uh, before this whole probation scandal blew up. I mean, we are now sitting here half to backpedal with an entire agency. I was sitting there and I couldn't, my mouth dropped open when the governor says, we have a rogue agency. And that's, that's what's happening with probation. And so, you know, there, we've, we're learning, we've already kind of been bitten by this law uh, that hasn't been updated in so long. And so, you know, that's one of the ways that we can actually move forward. And I think legislatively, it's going to be very helpful for us as well, because there's not a single person on Beacon Hill that's not going to go, ooh, yeah, probation. That's a sticky situation. So, um, you know, we're hoping that, that we can move forward with that. And um, we do know now that the courts, through the process, and I will, my lawyers can tell me if I'm incorrect on this, that there has been a, a, a more updating in court information because the process of discovery, uh, you know, both sides of a, of, uh, of a case can get this information. So we know that this is possible to happen, that things can be more, can, can be put into electronic form, that it can be converted over, and that we just need to move forward with those, with those standards. Um, so, you know, we're here at the beginning of, of the session. Uh, you know, you guys were very, very, very lucky here in uh, the Pioneer Valley as far as um, your legislative delegation. Um, but there's lots of ways that you uh, can get involved and, of course, remind them how wonderful they are to support um, these types of bills, and, and we will be moving forward with that. But, you know, this is our first attempt to, to sit there as we get more and more information through our FOIA. Um, requests will know better how to go in and fix things but we know that this these are the first two baby steps you know we need some standards we need some accountability we need to be updated into the 21st century and so the ACLU of Massachusetts is leading the way on this in, uh, um, you know as far as our state level goes and you know nationally we have thank God we have Chris and, and others working nationally and so hopefully as, as we move up and work from from the state level and then they're working in the federal level we can kind of all you know grapple with this and as, and as I said you know create a commonwealth and, and a country where you know you can have differing opinions and your name's not going to be written down in a book and you don't have a file on yourself and that when a couple of people who work for government who are deciding how to pay to, to spend our taxpayers money that they are accountable uh, to the people and, and those decisions when those decisions are made that it's transparent and we know what's going on so I mean these these are good positive steps that that we're going to take and you know we're really excited about the ACLU and we you hope you are as well and you know as I said if you sign up with us you can you can follow this um, it's not the world's most exciting uh, process the legislative process here in Massachusetts as I said it's two years long so you can go for quite some time but but we're there working every day we have a great team and um, you know, I, I think that's it. Well, that's great. See, we do have some good news. <laughs> yeah. uh, I thought what we'd do now is we have a little over half an hour and see if there are questions that you all would like to ask. And uh, were you going to? Yeah. The mic. Okay, we have more than one mic. We have a mic. So, okay, we'll yeah, see yeah, how technology. Hello, man. Oh, you're going to hold. Yeah, which is perfectly fine. Right. Yeah. My name is Len Simons. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, if you can, what we're going to do, we're going to repeat the question, so if you can be succinct about it, so that the sure. uh, television sure. uh, one minute, cameras, one minute would be okay. fine. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Len Simons. Um, I'm very much interested in everything that you talked about, but Chris said one mm -hmm. thing that I take exception to, personally. Good. I'm almost 70 years of age. The first 60 years of my life, I didn't feel like we wanted for a lack of military, police, uh, intelligence, True. oversight. <clears throat> you, you use the expression, they're trying to do the right thing or something of that mm -hmm. effect, or, or they're trying the best they could. Right. I don't really care. <laughs> <clears throat> as far Fair as enough. the law goes, I'm interested in doing what we can to regulate them. I think one better, one, one, one better way to do it is to be able to roll back some of this intrusive government. I have no use for it. Okay. And if we can find some way to, to, to roll it back, I'll, I'll be especially interested. Thank you. So if I might summarize, the question is, I think, is there a way and how, what is the way in which we roll back an intrusive and, can, and increasingly intrusive government. 
here, here. <laughs> uh, no, here. I mean, I, it's hard. It's frustrating to be in D.C. and you feel like you're in the swamp and you've got the machete and you're cutting down, but you're not. You know, there's still more growing. And I mean, there are the in, the intel the budget for intelligence activities in the United States has grown by grown by two and a half times since 9/11 which means on a very practical level you have built enormous bureaucracies whose sole purpose or I shouldn't say sole purpose one of whom's purposes at this point is to perpetuate itself and that is in many ways the biggest problem that we face with the fusion centers we face with the intelligence apparatus because they do not want to go away there are dollars there are jobs at stake there are dollars at stake so I agree 100%. I guess what I would like to do is to impose some standards so as to curb the abusive collection of information. But you are 100% correct. It's just it's difficult when you're sort of in the quagmire of DC. But but your point is very well taken. Oh, we're in the back, I guess. Francis, I promise we will get to you. I have a couple of questions. The first is, I heard years ago that there was some kind of, um, that there was surveillance going on in, in, some, in a building in Florence. There was some major uh, data collection happening. It's fine. And I don't know if anybody here knows about that. Um, if you know about it. So that's my first question. My second question is, the legislation discussed sounds terrific, and I'm just wondering whether there are deadlines built into that, because I know one way that agencies can not get you what you want is to just make you wait forever and give up. So I'm hoping there's, there's that kind of thing, specific thing in the legislation. So to summarize, the second question, first question was about whether anyone on the panel, I don't know about the spying in a building in Florence, Massachusetts, which I, I don't, but I'll be happy to talk to you later and see what we can find out. The second question was, in these legislative fixes that we have, are there deadlines that would be imposed on governmental agencies to res in responding to Freedom of Information Act or public records requests mm -hmm. so that in fact the statute, which promises these records, actually the promise of the statute is fulfilled? Um, the, the short answer is yes. Um, it, it, we're still drafting all of this, and of course, as you can imagine, when you're working to try to get something through, there's always things that are give and take. Uh, but in, in, in general, for, especially for, for FOIA requests, there, there are deadlines. And, and what, we, what we are hoping is that in this drafting process that, that, that we, there are going to be deadlines. I mean, right now, as you can imagine, we are sitting here saying, this needs to be done. We, we want this to be done. Will you do it? And so we're kind of, we're very there at the beginning of the process with those, with those conversations of, of making sure that we have enough buy-in to get this to go someplace. Um, but, but we agree with you. I mean, we are certainly not uh, of the ilk that you just go, woo, that passed and now we're done. Uh, you gotta make sure that they're implemented and that they start working. And just to add to that, so currently our public records laws say that an agency shall respond within 10 days but it's so hard for them to respond within 10 days because the records are all over the place that that deadline has become meaningless. Um, and we haven't even been able to go to court and say, you know, oh, it's been 10 days, give us our documents, because the courts understand that it takes longer. So I think our deadline is going to be, I, I don't know how many days we put into this bill, this draft, um, but it's going to be sort of a harder deadline. Um, and what other states have done is that if the agencies don't meet that deadline, they get fined. Um, and we would love to see that here in Massachusetts. And the other deadline-related issue is that we would like to see deadlines for purging of information. Mm -hmm. So when stuff goes into these databases, that it doesn't stay there forever. If nothing comes of it, uh, you know, within a few years, it should just be erased. Uh, first, Chris, my condolences. I was a lobbyist for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two questions. One is, um, I currently work for an organization that the FBI has labeled as terrorist. So I'd like to know what A is the definition of a terrorist organization, and B, what are the steps that you take to get an organization off this magic term terrorist? 
This is a gentleman uh, interested in expanding his uh, FBI file who has uh, <laughs> asked a question about an organization uh, that has been uh, termed and classified as terrorist and what are the remedies? Is that a fair summary? To get, to get the label off. Wow, I, I wish that there was a, a good answer to this question or even a credible answer to this question. The fact is that it's possible to label just about anyone a terrorist organization now, especially if you're doing it in secret in a database that's not accessible to the public, as many of these are. You'd simply do it, as we saw in the Maryland case. I mean, these, these people, and these are frequently, I mean, it's, it, it's kind of a case of black is white. I mean, you see organizations whose mission statement is to conduct peaceful protest and, you know, are peace groups who are then described as potential violent agitators. You know, it's, it, on what basis do you make that statement aside from the fact that no, no one is checking you and auditing you? So even the legal definition as the, the Supreme Court has defined terrorist organization is, is outlandishly broad. It can be material support for terrorist activities, which in, can include things like training for peace initiatives. If that, organi if that entity is potentially, you know, has been labeled a terrorist organization by the State Department, put on a, you know, a terrorist, the terrorist OFAC list. So, you know, it can be incredibly broad. In terms of getting off, it varies based on state law, and this goes back to the open records question, because it really, you know, you first have to learn about it. In most states, it's very difficult to get, to get into these files to learn what they have on you. And then it's, it's increasingly difficult to, you know, it's further difficult to adjudicate that question even once you do find it. And, and so I, I don't have a good answer, and I, I'm sorry that I don't. I told you it was wait, depressing. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> but the most important thing is that these fusion centers, all of them are state entities. They're localized, which means that you can, the people in this room can improve them because they will respond to you. They are largely state entities. They are state police. They respond in large part to state government, even though they do have federal actors in them. So if you can get state standards in place, you are the best situated to actually push back on this, at least in Massachusetts. You know, you'll keep some of that information out of the federal system, but you'll, and you'll also control what goes in the Massachusetts state databases. See, I told you I could be cheerful. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just want to, once again, moving forward with this legislatively, and it also goes back to our previous question, another thing that we have a learning curve on here in Massachusetts, I don't know if you all remember that wonderful Cory reform battle that we just finally got through, and that huge database that was completely out of control, and they weren't purging anything, and there's all these things that correct about it. Well, that took seven years, but we now have that battle under our belt, and we have, a, we have an educated... <laughs> No, but we now have, so these issues of us coming up and saying, look, this is the importance of making sure our data is good. This is the importance of purging. This is the importance of making sure who has access. We've already done a ton of education, both in the legislature and the general public on this. So at least we have a nice base as we start moving forward with, with more of these issues. Yeah, I, just to add that when it comes to the uh, fusion centers in Massachusetts, we should bear in mind, and I think the point has been made, but I want to emphasize it, that these fusion centers are subject to state law. We don't need the United States Congress to pass something to protect us in Massachusetts. We can do that through state legislation, state right. standards, and state oversight. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to take advantage of having the mic to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it, it sort of because this is something that the, federal that the federal government has control of only. So I actually just read on Twitter about an hour ago that Mark Ruffalo, the actor who was in The Kids Are All Right, that film, he's been active in anti-fracking pr uh, protests in New York State. Fracking is deep drilling for, I guess, it's natural gas. And um, as a result of that activism, he was recently put on a federal terrorist watch list. He learned when he tried to board an airplane. Um, TSA agents told him, actually. Um, so my question is related to that. How do you get off a terrorist watch list? Can you? I remember Ted Kennedy was on one, and it took him a long time to get off. So. <laughs> Ted Kennedy. We're suing them right now about this. 
Um, I mean, we have a, a series of plaintiffs who are on no-fly lists. U.S. citizens exiled from the United States, in fact, because they were not allowed to fly back into the country from foreign countries. They were literally told, this is a disabled former Marine vet trying to fly back for his disability hearing, who is not allowed because on the plane because of a no-fly list. We filed a lawsuit. We subsequently got all of those people back in the country, and then the lawsuit itself is ongoing. But the fact is that there is no process for getting off a terrorist watch list. We, what we have seen in the past is, is what I would characterize as an active attempt to prevent this from being challenged. We'll bring a suit or attempt, start to bring a suit. Suddenly, the person will mysteriously be taken off the list, and we will not have standing to bring a lawsuit. This has happened multiple times. So it's very difficult. No-fly lists are pernicious. They're secret government lists that are standard lists that just keep you, that label you a terrorist and keep you from exercising rights like the ability to fly. I mean, you cannot think of anything that is more totalitarian, Eastern European, Stasi than this. Oh, I hate them. I hate them. But this, but I mean, I think our lawsuit is probably, I, I hope, is going to, to get fruit because this is such a due process violation, at least in my mind. But it's very difficult to get off a terrorist watch list. Hopefully, if the su suit is successful, it will be easier. Hi, thanks for being here. My name is James. I, I have um, one uh, brief story and a question. Second, First, I'd like to know what the status is of that particular case of a uh, U.S. citizen on a CIA hit list. Uh, essentially, uh, that's a violation of the Sixth and Fourteenth Amendment as well, but he's being pursued for speech issues. So, so the question was, just to summarize, uh, first there was a reference to the Washington Post story, Top Secret America, which we would all commend to everyone's attention. It's an amazing story and frightening. It did not get the attention it deserved, uh, but it is, it is posted on the web. And the second part of the question had to do, I believe, with the uh, lawsuit that has been brought against the possibility of people being put on a national hit list and uh, allowed under this court the executive branch to be executed. Sorry, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> on, is this the, the case we're talking about is, is actually, we're actually bringing on behalf of Anwar Alaki's father. But Anwar Alaki is a U.S. citizen who's currently residing in, in Yemen. He has not been indicted for ever, anything. He is not under any criminal charge. But he has been placed by the president on a list of people who may be assassinated at any time and in any place. Imagine how we would feel if the Russians came into the United States and assassinated anyone, a Russian citizen, anyone. Imagine the, up, the outrage we would feel. There has been no criminal, there's been no due process for this individual. There's no there's no way to know what put him on the list. And I agree, it is, it is to me at least one of the most manifest violations of constitutional process. I, I, and it's a difficult case because we are fighting state secrets, where the government says to us that we, we don't even have the right to bring this suit because they have a good reason and it's a secret reason. And that's where the, the current stage is we're at. Um, but we'll, we'll battle on the state secret grounds. We'll, We've had some, some really outrageous things dismissed on state secrets grounds, including the rendition and you know flying people to foreign countries to be tortured has been dismissed on state secrets grounds. So it's a, it's a very difficult barrier to overcome. Um, I, I mean, I hope we'll be able to do so here. First of all, I'd like to say we're showing the film Gaslands Friday night at the Media Education Foundation. This is the film that uh, deals with fracking. And I want to know how much money is Homeland Security putting into Northampton and how many people are working for Homeland Security in Northampton? I don't know. <laughs> yet. Uh, the yet is because, as Laura mentioned, we have made a request to the Western Massachusetts Division, which sends out the money. And we have received a response back. And the response is that on January 5th, I may go to the office and pick up three 
uh, CDs, which will have all the information. The information is going to will be massive, I assume. It will be technical, and it will have a lot to do with contracts. It will have a lot to do, I assume, with this kind of equipment has been bought by this town, and this type of equipment has been bought in that. It's going to have very technical specifications, and then we're going to have to have that interpreted. But one thing that I hope we'll get from that is which towns have gotten how much money from Homeland Security in Western Massachusetts. That will be very interesting. It will also allow us to follow up with specific requests to specific towns saying, how'd you spend it? What did you do? Now, they may say we bought first responder uh, uh, fire equipment of one sort or another, or we bought uh, uh, police communication equipment of one sort or another. Um, that, I have no doubt, is true. Uh, some of it will be easily interpretable, I think, and some of it is not going to be easily discernible from by a layperson at all. Uh, and if there's a lot of it, it's going to take some uh, staffing and time and uh, effort to try to figure out what it is that we really have. But they promised it January 5th. So we'll see. Well, since you mentioned CDs, um, a couple years ago I wasn't able to get out of the States. Um, I was stopped. Well, I, I just checked in at the border in Buffalo on the way to Canada. I was on my way to Detroit, actually, and they put me into the computer and they instantly took my passport over to customs. And they said they were going to send me to the warehouse, send my truck to the warehouse, and they were going to go through it. And there was no explanation for this other than finally they said that I needed to give them an exact, I'm a touring musician, an exact inventory of every CD the title, every shirt, what the size was, what it said, what color, and they were going to do that. And had they, I didn't know what the warehouse was, and I didn't want to go there. Particularly. <laughs> and, um, I don't know what it is, and I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess ultimately, after about three hours, I got my passport back um, because they were tired of it. It was just harassment. So I guess one question is because I, I, whatever list I'm on, I'm on. But is there a law that says, I mean, a search and seizure, in a way, I mean, do, is there anything that says they have a right to go through with no, with no cause? I mean, there's nothing on a record that would say I am at all a Just dangerous person. clarify, U.S. Customs or Canadian? U.S. So, to summarize, there's a story about uh, being harassed at the border, being detained, being threatened to be sent to somewhere called the warehouse that none of us want to go to. We don't sure what it is, but we don't want to go there. And the issue that is raised by all of this is what ever happened to the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable searches and seizures? And doesn't there have to be some reasonable grounds or probable cause or something like that before you go and hassle, detain, and interrogate an American citizen? Do you want to <laughs> uh, there's competition so on talk about. No, 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 please. Talk about the laptop, please. Talk. She can talk whatever you want. I was just going to, yeah. Well, <laughs> there's a lot the of sort of too. depressing answer, and then the, what we're doing about <laughs> it again. Um, there we go. Customs and Border Patrol claims broad authority to search and seize anything that comes through the border. And it's not just at the border, it's 100 miles inside the border. So I think. We're probably 100 miles. Parts of us are. Oh, yeah. By the border right here, mm -hmm. right? So definitely the eastern part of the state and probably here as well. Um, so they claim that they can search anything that you bring in um, and that they can seize things as well. Uh, we're currently fighting this. There's a lawsuit, hopefully Chris can tell you more about, um, that our national office has, has brought about people whose laptops get taken. Um, and, you know, we, we think about laptops as, you know, part of your personal papers. Um, you know, it's kind of like a diary, or um, it has so much of your personal information in it. Well, they're now seizing those laptops, um, looking through them, keeping them for months and months, um, and just reading everything, requiring you to give them their password, you know, your password, to look into them. Um, and we, we think that that's unconstitutional. So, you know, we've got a lawsuit about that currently. Um, but, you know, you should be aware if you do travel that anything you bring in, your phone, your camera, um, it can all be searched and uh, seized. I mean, that, that pretty much does summarize it. It's a depressingly broad <laughs> power, so it doesn't take that much nuance. 
Um, and yes, we, we have the laptop case, we, and we're, we're hoping, I mean, typically, unfortunately, what happens, of course, is these cases rise in, in terrible contexts, like the child porn context. So you get really bad law because they're really, you have really bad facts. And so we brought a case by, you know, a scholar who was traveling and who had his laptop seized. He's a, he's, you know, studying, is it, is it, I think it's Muslim studies. He's got a, but anyway, it's the kind of thing that would really make a customs officer suspicious. Um, and so we're, we're challenging on his behalf at the seizure of his laptop. And our hope is that we can begin to bring some level of Fourth Amendment protection to the border. But it's, a, it's an upward slog because there's decades of bad law on this. Other questions or comments? Yes. Um, I was just wondering, are there any documented instances of uh, police uh, doing intelligence operations on uh, protesters or uh, sort of similar activities in Massachusetts. The question is, what documented cases are there of police doing, for lack of a better word, intelligence work on protesters in Massachusetts? Yeah, there is some documented evidence, and like I said, on the website, aclu.org slash spy dash files dash Massachusetts. Um, we have all of the documents up there. And we have done individual requests on people who, you know, we believe have been spied upon and gotten some stuff back. Um, so those are, are up there. Um, and there's stories from all over the country as well up, up on the website. Um, there, you know, there are many stories of vegans, vegetarians especially for some reason, or especially <laughs> dangerous, um, animal activists. Um, Can I tell my favorite one? Yeah. Because I've been de accused of being depressing to <laughs> share this, this anecdote, which I think is, is scary but also hysterical. Stephen Colbert had on his show a gentleman who was arrested for taking photographs. And he was in Union Station in Washington. He was photographing the Amtrak trains. <coughs> and the security there was the, deemed this to be incredibly suspicious. Why would anyone want to photograph a train? He must have a, a, you know, a dangerous activity in mind. So Colbert brought him on the show and asked him, Sir, why were you photographing a train? It turns out that Amtrak has a photography contest where you submit photographs of trains for the Amtrak photography contest. And while I think it's suspicious that anyone would want to participate in the anti photography <laughs> contest. Now, now. I mean, it's not, it's just, but this is, it's nonsensical. It's just, it's, it's foolish. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll that was great. <laughs> the question is, is what do we know about the U.S. military's involvement in this intelligence gathering endeavor? Do you, uh, I mean, I can. Yeah. Um, I think it's safe to say, as I've said several times, that the details are a little murky. Um, we know that, for example, do I have to be louder, Carol? Am I? No. Um, oh, okay. We can talk, but I'd love to have someone who has more detail come up and talk about it. But I, I will just say that we've seen military intelligence gather information around military bases and put them in, in lists. It's called the Talon database, and it's nominally a list of threats to military bases, but it sort of amounts to a list of activist organizations. Um, and and the, the, what actual military is doing in these fusion centers is, is many times very unclear. You want to talk about it a little more? Come on. Let me introduce Professor Christopher Pyle, Mount Holyoke College. Uh, among his many, many distinguished. Here, uh, it's at my seat. Oh, come sit in any okay. chair. You've got to be on a TV. <laughs> Professor I'm not, Pyle. I'm not getting up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll sit down. Isn't this what Oprah does? She has like, a guest host come in at the end? <laughs> uh, Professor Pyle is a national security expert, uh, has written widely, has written a book that covers this topic, published in the last year, uh, is interviewed uh, widely on national media, has written uh, for publication throughout the United States and also has on his resume the fact that he is on the board of directors of the ACLU of Massachusetts. 
<laughs> what a lead up. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm a former intelligence agent from the U.S. Army. Back in 1970, I disclosed the Army's domestic spying operations in the United States and recruited 125 of their intelligence agents to tell what they knew about it to members of Congress, the courts, and of course the ACLU. As a result, we shut that program down. But the Army back then had 1,500 plainclothes agents watching every demonstration of 20 people or more. So some of you may have been watched by them. Fast forward to 2005. NBC television came to see me with a stack of reports and asked if I would comment on them on the nightly news. There were 400 pages of reports of suspicious incidents, which Chris has described very well, and it was all garbage. It was all gossip and rumor. It was reports of somebody photographing a sign outside a military installation. And so I went on television and I said, this was all garbage. And a year later, the unit which was collecting that information, the counterintelligence field activity, was abolished. And all 1,000 of their employees were reassigned. This was a unit in the Pentagon that nobody had ever heard about. Now, before you get too yeah, right. happy about this, before I <laughs> fuck up your <laughs> spirits, uh, I, I'm fully confident, I have great faith in them, that they will have reassigned some of these functions elsewhere. In fact, the fusion centers in the Department of Homeland Security now collect suspicious incident reports. And they're the same kind of reports. And they will go nowhere. We've heard a lot about the chilling effect here tonight. Maybe you should be afraid. Don't be. Don't be. Because it's garbage for the most part. What you should be concerned about as a citizen is the colossal waste of your taxpayer money at a time when this country is in financial disrepair. The Washington Post articles that were referred to show that 33 very large buildings have been erected in the Washington, D.C. area in the last two years. It's the only source of new employment in Washington, D.C. is all these intelligence agencies backed up by private corporations. And this hasn't been mentioned here tonight. Private corporations make a good deal of money collecting garbage on behalf of the government. Software companies are offering all sorts of clever ways to massage this information. The chief lobbyist who recently moved to, uh, to Boston, Massachusetts, moved his law practice there, was a fellow named John Ashcroft. <laughs> but he's not the only one, because this is a corporate boondoggle of enormous proportions. And the garbage about you, of course, can be quite erroneous. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. Because I irritated them, the Army created a 50-man unit in the Pentagon to investigate me <laughs> and to try to discredit me. They took over the domestic war room down in the basement. And they worked at it for an hour, a year and a half and didn't get much. But they sent some stuff over to the Treasury Department where I was put on Nixon's enemies list. And That's eventually you I know got... you've arrived. Yeah. You know, uh, well, I was, it was actually very nice. Um, <laughs> Uh, you've heard that these people are nice people, and many they are. They discovered that my wife had overpaid our taxes by $154 and had to give us the money back. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, you know, you can be thankful for these small services. <laughs> but in that basement, in those file drawers, were the results of investigations of me. One of the reports said that I had received my law degree from Bowdoin College. Since when does Bowdoin College give out law degrees, <laughs> right? And they also could not locate me for six months. I disappeared. I was in Army Intelligence. <laughs> okay? Now this is 
These are not the sharpest knives in the drawer. <laughs> and you should be concerned about that. You should be concerned about ineptitude, particularly when there is surveillance of this sort. They don't know what a terrorist is. They don't know what a threat is. And they certainly can't speak foreign languages. And that's the ludicrous part of this whole system. A very simple rule would eliminate about 98% of it is that they can't do it unless they know at least three foreign languages from the Middle East. <coughs> then they can go look for terrorists. But we don't do that. As we did in the, 50, in the 60s, we only investigate in the English language because that's all our people know. <laughs> it's like searching for your car keys under the, under the street light when you lost them in the middle of the block. Well, you'd search there because the light's better, right? <laughs> well, this is the problem, that this is not competence. And it's a glorious waste of your money and mine. And we do have other important needs. Does that answer your question? I thought that was great. <laughs> I like you bring a pinch hitter in. I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank our panelists who are great. You're really terrific. Okay. Thank you very much. I want to encourage everyone, uh, if you are not a member of the ACLU and the ACLU of Massachusetts, it's a two for sale. <laughs> Sign up for one, you get both memberships. In the back of the room is a place to sign up and you can actually have a membership given to you personally by the executive director of the American <laughs> Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts, who is basically telling me if I don't do this well, we're all, I'm in a lot of trouble now. <laughs> uh, but please do that. Uh, we, this, is a, uh, this is a fight that we're all in together. This is a matter that will, in fact, define the kind of country we have for decades and decades to come, the kind of country that our children and our grandchildren We'll live in and grow up in, and it is. We made some fun of some things tonight. I think the sense of humor is a vital component of this fight, but understanding just how serious the matter, these matters are, how large the stakes are, and how important the outcome will be, is something that rests with all of us. So I'd encourage you to join us in this battle, and I thank you all for your attention, your great questions, your interesting comments. You've been a fabulous audience. Thanks very much. Thank you.